Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Leo, for uh, providing this opportunity every year. And, uh, and thank you for still remembering me to come and uh, enjoy <laughs> the time. Um, I, um, we have heard uh, incredible, beautiful lectures uh, today about many topics, uh, and um, especially about COPD, obviously, that uh, I especially follow and like. And um, uh, we have learned a lot. And uh, I would like to have um, you know, this lecture to just uh, try to show you some of the mechanism of the tissue remodeling in uh, COPD and uh, at least the way we, uh, uh, meaning uh, I and, uh, and Marina, uh, look at this and, uh, and we have uh, worked uh, at this together. There is uh, a problem, uh, a, the, uh, there is not a problem, I guess, with the definition, the problem comes after, but uh, the definition, there are two things that we want like to address and that are important. One is that the, with COPD that we all agree that there is an airflow limitation that is not fully reversible and usually progressive. And the other one that uh, is uh, probably related, uh, that as we'll see, they associate that this is associated with an abnormal inflammatory response. Obviously, by the time we see these patients, they also have uh, some comorbidities that I think that uh, we have talked a little bit about this uh, in this meeting also. The problem we face with COPD it's a problem that uh, you know all medical practitioners, if you want, have in general, because we prefer to to have a categorical approach to the disease diagnosis, uh, meaning either a patient is healthy or a patient uh, is ill, and um, you know it's much easier also to have a disease that has a short term uh, rather than the long term disease, and uh, so you have somebody who comes in with cough and sputum production and a fever and uh, it was well yesterday and it's not well today, then it's much easier to treat, it's much easier to understand than, uh, you know, some diseases uh, that, uh, and many of the ones that we'll be talking today, uh, but especially chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that are not always lend themselves to clear definition of the onset of the disease. And uh, unfortunately, like again is the case in COPD, it is in the, uh, only in the advanced, or mainly in the advanced stages of CPD or COPD that we can diagnose the disease easily by the medical practitioner. And then that leads to a problem that uh, we all know, is that by the time we see the patients that we see, most of them have a lung that looks like this, where there is all emphysema, have an airway that has gone from this beautiful, uh, very uh, elegant, uh, small airway to this uh, airway that is, uh, they are about the same size that you think it, that you see here, that there is absolutely nothing in here that we can reverse. There is absolutely nothing in here that we can treat. And there is so much of we are at the end of the disease that we really, there is nothing, a lot that we can say about it. So. You know, the uh, progression from the health of disease is something that um, we have in COPD not paying enough attention to, and is that uh, uh, because the COPD is a disease that uh, has an insidious onset, there is an in inevitably a period when the lung can be considered to be in the transition between health and disease. And uh, it is uh, extremely important, and we don't do it enough, that we should identify this transition phase in order to understand the factors that determine the progression from the health of the disease and also the potential to allow us to um, uh, identify uh, susceptible persons. And this is extremely important. So that such knowledge uh, would uh, facilitate the development of markers and for say, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, treatment uh, for these abnormalities. So here we are. This is the uh, translation, if you want, of the famous Fletcher uh, diagram. But here we have the age, so here we have the FEV fall. And if we take three patients that are smokers, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we do the way we look at uh, them today, or most of them, 
uh, is at this stage, where the FV1 is very low, when the lung is terminal. But uh, look at the three cases here. The three cases, these are three smokers. Who, this one has fallen about 35 a, a year. This one has fallen 75, this one in between. Obviously, the three patients are different. And obviously, this guy that we see here, it took a long time to get there. And this long time, as you can see from the beginning, can really happen from the beginning of smoking. So how do these men, how did the old women, how these people, smokers, or most of them smokers, develop this irreversible disease? And, um, um, you know, that we know now that uh, there are two components of, uh, in order to develop this irreversible disease. We know that uh, what we have, the normality that these patients have, is an abnormality of the flow. And uh, so we have to uh, really think about the conductive airways first. And here it is, the bronchial tree of a human. And you can see we have these small airways we have in here. We have 60,000 of them. Because, even though they are small, what we think about when they generate flow is the cross-sectional area of these airways. And obviously, if you put 60,000 of those together, the cross-sectional area is much going to be much, much bigger than the cross-sectional area of the trachea. So in a normal person, there is very little resistance at the level of these very small airways, and most of the resistance is going to be in the large airways. And again, you see that flow is the, the, the related to the pressure that you, you do to generate the flow and the resistance that is really uh, determined by the diameter of these airways. Now, as we smoke, and as uh, over years and years and years, what happens is this, that the airway, it goes from there to here. And you can see how the diameter is. And obviously, because of the cross-sectional area of these very small airways, it's going to be very small, now have gone from this to this. And obviously, because the resistance is inversely related to the radius to the fourth, you can imagine that the flow is going to be very decreased. And so this is going to happen over time with the abnormality of these airways. Now, you can say, well, I mean, we said that uh, if, uh, if uh, we don't, uh, I mean, in order to get there, you have to start here. So you have to start earlier in age, and you can see that there are going to be people that even though they smoke, nothing happens to them. Some of them, something might happen to them, and some of them really are going to get very severe COPD. So wouldn't be worthwhile to look at these people earlier on, if we can, in order to try to learn something better or more about this disease and, you know, make maybe this kind of decay, a pattern of decay, could be a phenotype to be considered because this is going to be an answer in here. Why this one does not lose flow uh, while this one does, even though they smoke the same? Well, that would be nice if really we knew that uh, young smokers might be affected, and they are. There are plenty of literature, that is some of that quoted in here, that the annual rate of decline in people between 25 and 36, if they smoke, could be very different, 60 milliliters a year, than th the, if they only smoke 38 milliliters a year. So this is uh, really an important factor. Uh, we also know that uh, Young adults, uh, in a large percentage of them, 30, uh, up to 5%, already have mild to moderate COPD when they smoke. And uh, the proper diagnosis of obstruction is uh, extremely important since airflow obstruction in a smoking young adults is highly predictive of low lung function in the middle age. So really, you know, here we have enough data already to uh, try to go back and understand why and how these things happen. Now, we saw, uh, you know, the fundamental physiopathology, if you want, or flow obstruction. What about how this happens? Uh, how does it go around? Well, we know that in the definition that it's associated with an abnormal inflammatory response, and uh, we know it is. And it is interesting because uh, when this uh, in a small airway, this is an epithelium, as obviously, as you can see, and um, obviously, when uh, smoke comes in, the first place it hits is going to be the epithelium. The epithelium 
that normally has these uh, beautiful ciliated uh, type of cells, uh, and it has these Clara cells, and these uh, 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 Clara cells are going to provide a surfactant that helps to keep their way open. This epithelium is going to prevent uh, fluid to come in, so to keep the, the, the airway, if you want, uh, dry. And, um, and so this is a fundamental uh, a, uh, a structure to protect the airway, uh, even to protect uh, the muscle from going into bronchoconstriction. The first thing that, one of the first things that happened with these airways is that they developed these goblet cells. So the Clara cells are replaced by these goblet cells. The surfactant of the Clara cells is lost. The, the, the mucus that uh, the, Clara, the uh, goblet cells secrete into the airway are going to really produce, uh, again, some not only a lack of uh, surface, surface material and, uh, and, and surface tension, but also is going to be mucus that uh, is going to accumulate uh, in their ways um, a, at that level. Um, and the other thing that happens with this epithelium, this is the previous uh, airway that somehow has lost the epithelium. And you see this loss of epithelium is going to be very dangerous because there's a lot of receptors uh, that uh, might influence the muscle constriction when they are is denuded uh, like this. And besides that, there's all kind of fluid that's going to come because the permeability is lost and this fluid is going to fill the, uh, the, uh, the lumen and is going to promote closure. And among other things, there is not going to be uh, any surfactant. But the most important thing, that, uh, or one of the most important things that this epithelium is going to do once it's damaged, is going to uh, send danger signals. And these danger signals that we know that proceed from the epithelium and that you know, fibrosis of the lung also seems to uh, uh, start in the epithelium and endothelium. And this is going to really going to trigger the first uh, uh, chain of events that we have in these patients in which the, um, you know, this danger signal is going to really trigger a very, very important uh, inflammatory reaction with all kind of uh, cytokines that will promote the presence of the innate type of inflammation uh, in which neutrophils and macrophages are going to be the main uh, um, uh, cells, and these cells, uh, through uh, proteinases, oxidative stress, and so on, are going to really <coughs> produce all kind of injury of epithelium, injury of uh, epithelial endothelial cells, and um, uh, with the potential of either liberating or producing antigenic products uh, that, through the uh, TLR, the uh, toll-like receptors, can be presented to the uh, uh, to the uh, dendritic cells that we know are present in abundance around these uh, areas and these patients. Now, this will trigger a very important uh, reaction, and interestingly enough, we have shown a new winner a uh, long time ago. Uh, we both have shown that uh, young smokers uh, do have abnormalities in the lung. This is what new winner described as called the respiratory bronchiolitis, in which you can see the terminal bronchial uh, here with an enormous amount of macrophages that uh, happen in the smokers but not in non-smokers and a small airway already in a young person with, uh, with an important inflammatory infiltrate around the airway that unless somehow this inflammatory uh, stimulus uh, that happens immediately after a smoking or soon after a smoking is a stop and it is a stop in, uh, you know, as we know, since 80% of the smokers do not develop any kind of uh, abnormality in the lung directly in the airways and emphysema, then this will progress and will progress into this type of airway, this type of airway in which you can see in here that it has an enormous amount of inflammatory infiltrate, very thick in wall, smaller diameter. Imagine this one totally open with uh, um, and the fibrosis uh, and so on. <coughs> now, this is uh, the kind of inflammatory uh, you know, type of airway that we can see. And um, this inflammation of the airway will also promote, you know, that with the smoke initially already, you can have a latent uh, THF beta um, that we need, a, you know, something like the MMP, the, the metal pro metalloproteinase 9, in order to really activate it and produce uh, real THB. And then with uh, 
fibrotic uh, 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 tissue factors, uh, this will really uh, help in producing the uh, fibrosis in their ways, not only in their ways, but we can also see that in the alveolar wall of, uh, of these patients. Now, if uh, the disease progresses, if it's not controlled in the st what we call a step one that was innate uh, abnormality, we can then, these uh, dendritic cells arrive into the lymph nodes and promote the, the uh, you know, they send these uh, signals, if you want, to lymphocytes, both uh, T uh, lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, and uh, this uh, will convert the uh, initial uh, innate uh, uh, inflammation into a um, adaptive inflammation in which uh, T cells abundantly seen on their ways, as Marina said, uh, had demonstrated uh, some years ago, and you can see them in red in here, I hope, and this is a smaller way, normal, and this is an abnormal. And she also showed that uh, the FEV1 is a drop, is related to the increase in these inflammatory cells. Now, if, uh, again, if we cannot control this uh, adaptive immune reaction, and certainly we can try, and then the body tries to control, um, but if we c it continues into, you know, can really become a, 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 an inflammatory that uh, resembles very much an autoimmune lung injury, in which, uh, you know, after even after years of smoke of non-smoking, these people might have a still a very very profuse inflammation, and then uh, in this inflammation is now with T cells with the B cells, and then using you know, all the armamentary that it can have, including the innate Im immune uh, cells, I mean, they are going to destroy the lung, producing more antigens, and the whole circle will be closed, and the disease continues. Now, at the end, the airways uh, will, uh, you know, they uh, lose uh, their attachment, so-called, and you can see how these airways attach to the lung, and every time we breathe, we open their way by pulling. Now, these attachments get very inflamed, and they eventually break, and then we end up with an airway that is not suspended by the lung, so that uh, really when we take a breath, I mean the lung, the airway doesn't open, and that contributes again to the abnormality um, of the lung. So in, uh, again, in summary, briefly, what happens is that from this airway that we saw that it was nice and open, and you had a very large cross-sectional area, then we slowly, slowly, slowly over years, we go from there to there, in which the airway now is very narrow, with a very a narrow cross-sectional area and a very large increase in resistance, producing the loss in flow. Now, there is obviously, a, this is an extremely important component, but there is another extremely important component, and it's the emphysema. The emphysema, as you know, the, uh, the, the, the emphysema of the, uh, of the lung, Inflow has uh, an important component because uh, it provides the elastic recoil, and the elastic recoil is the pressure that we need in order to empty the lung. We have shown many years ago also that um, if you decree, if you quantitate emphysema, here emphysema is expressed as the volume of alveolar wall, so that from normal, from no no volume of alveolar wall in here, so there's a lot of emphysema. You can see that the number of T cells per cubic millimeter is extremely high, increases really, really linearly with the, the amount of emphysema, and so does the macrophages. So there is also a relation between these uh, uh, lymphocytes that there are here and uh, this uh, loss of, uh, of lung tissue with emphysema. Now, interestingly enough, and this is, uh, uh, there, are, there is only two types, there is two types of emphysema we heard, um, you know, from the CT scan that these people develop. Uh, one, this is a normal lung. You can see that alveolar are nice and, um, and small with alveolar ducts. This is a central lobular emphysema uh, under the microscope in which you have a central area of emphysema surrounded by normal alveoli. And this is the panlobular emphysema. You see the panlobular emphysema, if you compare any kind of size of alveoli, either there or here, you can see that everything is evenly large. 
So this is a very, very, uh, a, a lot of emphysema. And interestingly enough, this is something that uh, for the people who look at the CT scan, we know that we can have at least 30% of the lung with this type of emphysema that is not detected by the CT scan. Because as you can see, there is not real big holes of any kind, but every single alveolar is larger. Now, you can think about it and say, well, I mean, maybe you think that the elasticity loss in this type of emphysema would be the same of this type of emphysema. Well, the obvious intuitive uh, answer to that is no. I mean, cannot be. Well, it is not. And if we are, you know, in the, one of the studies we did about this, if you're looking at the lungs with emphysema uh, after uh, having surgery and removing the lung and having uh, pulmonary function tests, including uh, a, a compliance and, uh, and uh, elastic uh, measurements, we found that for the same amount of FEV1, um, CLE and PLE, the, the compliance, uh, the, uh, the elasticity expressed by the shape of the pressure volume curve, uh, that's called K, is normal in central lobular emphysema and is extremely abnormal. The K, the K factor, K, K shape, increases with, uh, with loss of elasticity. As you can see, there is a very important difference between one and another. And what's more interesting even, if you take FEV1, FVC, flow, and you look at elasticity in CLE against flow, there is no relation between the, last, the loss of elastic recoil and flow in central lobular emphysema, but there is a very good relation between loss of elastic recoil and flow in panlobular emphysema. In, you know, we think that this is the, <coughs> the problem is difficult to, to, com to, uh, to diagnose uh, without uh, doing uh, elastic uh, recoil measurements. But this is the real, um, a real phenotype, if you want, a pathological phenotype uh, in these patients uh, with emphysema, and it is common. Another thing that's important about this type of emphysema is that you can see that in certain lobular emphysema, this is the type of airway that most commonly are seen, and it looks a little bit like asthma, or quite a bit like asthma. While the in, in panlobular emphysema, the airways are not as diseased, and it's not unusual at all to see this kind of uh, airways. And when we look at the diameters of these airways, the, as the proportion of airways less than 400 microns in diameter, you can see that in central lobular emphysema, almost 50% of airways have a much, you know, this very, very small family of airways, while in panlobular emphysema, there is about 30, 25, 30%, so much less. So that's, uh, so this is uh, uh, a very uh, different type of air, a, um, airway abnormality also in this, uh, in this type of emphysema. Now, because of this type of airway that, as we said, resembles very much asthma, who have increased muscle and a lot of inflammation, you know, we thought it would be very interesting to see if, uh, uh, if this, uh, this type of airway uh, might have some uh, similarities with asthma as far as the inflammation, and we were very interested to, to see eosinophils and mast cells in these two groups of, uh, of emphysema. So we did, and we found that there was no difference at all in eosinophils between the two, but we did find that both in the parenchyma that I won't show and um, in the airways, we found that the central lobular emphysema have uh, more um, mast cells in their airways, and especially these uh, mast cells were in and around the muscle in the central lobular emphysema airway that you have it in here. And, it, and when we took uh, the uh, airway reactivity that we measured in all these patients, and we grouped their airway reactivity in the words less than uh, three, uh, three to eight and more than eight milligrams per milliliter, uh, you see that uh, these people who had the lowest uh, airway, or the highest airway reactivity, lowest uh, metacolin uh, those have an enormous amount of mast cells, um, a, very different from the others. So there is a component of airway reactivity in the uh, lung of, uh, in the airways of central lobular emphysema that we do not have in panlobular emphysema. And again, this is part of this, uh, if you want, pathological phenotype that closes and might explain a little bit the overlap syndrome in some cases with uh, asthma, COPD. 
So finally, the pathophysiology of COPD, if you want, is very complex. We have the airway abnormalities that we've seen. Uh, not only the abnormalities are there, but depends on the emphysema and depends also of the reactivity that this patient might have. And then we have the emphysema, and they have the emphysema that produces the loss of elastic recoil, uh, that is a driving pressure for, uh, for flow. And as, as we've shown you, um, you know, depending on the, uh, the type of emphysema also can vary. So the, you know, the, the resultant flow is a balance of the amount of abnormality of their ways versus the amount of emphysema and also the type of emphysema. Uh, so there is a combination of both, but at the end, most people have emphysema and most people have abnormality of the, of the airways. So that uh, we end up like this. And this is, uh, that doesn't show very well for uh, perhaps, but this is a hand on somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. Final rheumatoid arthritis. What can we do? Well, we can do some surgery, try to get these uh, fingers together uh, better, but uh, like we do with lung volume reduction surgery. But, you know, as we get there, this state of COPD that most of the ones we see and investigate, what can we treat? What can we learn? Because you see the emphysema, the COPD that we see, at least in, in our stage, and we talk about and we investigate, is this and this. Now, there is no treatment that for this, obviously. There is no, you know, and then the, uh, uh, and there is a pity that so much money is going in to try to prove that the drugs that they are developed for asthma are good for this, well, can be gone somewhere else. So, what shall I say? Well, I say that I think I said everything I wanted to say, but uh, the lung abnormality is responsible for the obstructive, is the consequence of a, an adaptive immune inflammation. COPD evolves undiagnosed for years before it presents to medical attention, at which time is usually too late and no effective treatment is available. I do believe that it's our responsibility, meaning the scientific community, to change the approach for the identification, diagnosis, and research of the disease targeting young smokers mainly. And it should be the responsibility of our scientific community to set these goals in a priority, provide grants, and even convince industry to burst funds toward this project. It would be nice if we could get some of this done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for your interesting presentation. Uh, the discussion is open. Awesome. Please. Manuel, uh, this morning we heard from uh, it, uh, our HIV guy um, about uh, the different uh, um, role of reaction of the host and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and feature of the stimulus of the uh, insults. So the question to you is, uh, considering that there is some coming evidence, that, uh, for instance, the COPD induced by uh, indoor pollution may be prevalent at small airways compared to parenchyma, compared to smoking. And uh, similarly for asthma. How would you fit the role of the uh, trigger, the role of the stimulus in uh, the specific feature you discussed uh, in the lung. Is it something specific in cigarette smoke versus uh, cigar smoke versus, uh, uh, you know, indoor pollution or versus uh, asthma that is actually modeling in a different way the, the airways? And that can be investigated if it is, has not been yet. Well, that's uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting question that uh, um, that uh, probably deserves a, a book. Um, the, uh, the first thing is that uh, the indoor pollution, I suppose that uh, you are uh, you're talking about biomass, biomass and so on. Uh, we wrote a paper about biomass in the, about, uh, from Mexico and we compare the, uh, the pathology of the lung in autopsy uh, of women dying of my biomass COPD and uh, smokers uh, with COPD. Um, there, is, uh, there is no question about the, uh, the biomass uh, airways and the lamparenchyma 
have more fibrosis than the other ones, um, the, but see. they also have emphysema. The smaller waves are extremely abnormal, um, and uh, so is the parenchyma, but also the parenchyma have more fibrosis. <laughs> Obviously, the composition, you know, interestingly enough, we know what tobacco has into it, because, you know, pretty much it's the, uh, the same. Biomass is called biomass is because it's not wood. It's whatever they can find that burns, they burn. And it could be plastic, could be whatever, you know. But uh, so that's uh, it's very difficult to know exactly what's the investigation or what is the uh, you know the uh, the abnormality that we find, uh, you know, what is the uh, the substances that they have in there. We know that cigarettes have an enormous amount of uh, you know whatever thousands and thousands of products. Uh, uh, oxidative that probably biomass has too, but we don't know, or at least I don't know. Um, and uh, and the um, a, um, a, and I think that uh, this is uh, this is an important difference. The um, the other thing that I can say is that if you the, you know the long time ago studies in uh, in mice uh, with ozone. If you uh, bring a, a somebody, an animal, to, to breathe ozone and then you do biopsies, the inflammation is very similar. At least the initial inflammation of the lung is very similar. So I think probably everything starts the same way. So then, but then there are some more fibrogenic factors and less fibrogenic factors. Now, asthma is a totally different disease. I mean, we know they have an antigen that comes from outside. It's a different type of reaction that promotes the TH2 type of uh, inflammation rather than the TH1. The, the important thing, of course, in all this, and this is that what I hope that people in the gene therapy that do pay attention to, is that uh, there is obviously a susceptibility factor. I mean, we know that only 15, maybe 20% of the smokers develop COPD, only maybe 2% develop severe stage 4 COPD, so there is something in there. Now, we have shown and everybody have shown that the inflammation is extremely important. We know that inflammation is an adaptive type of inflammation that, uh, you know, we have called uh, uh, autoimmunity, probably is an autoimmunity uh, type of problem in some patients uh, at the end of the COPD. So, tolerance and response, you know, the ability to respond or non respond to antigens, I think should be an extremely important thing to investigate. And this goes for every disease on the, uh, on the spectrum that you just mentioned. You know, that, uh, so, uh, same thing in asthma. I mean, that's everybody exposed to antigens, but only 10%, you know, respond to that. So, complicated different issues, uh, but you know, they all come to the lung disease, but at the end, the lung is going to respond the way it, it knows how to respond. Thank you. Prego. Considerato che il professore Bosio parla italiano meglio di me, <laughs> posso approfittare per <laughs> fare una domanda in italiano. A Napoli si dice che la chiesa di Santa Chiara, una famosa chiesa, mise le porte di ferro dopo che era stata derubata. Dico. dico, ma non sarebbe allora ragionevole anticipare il trattamento anche quando siamo al di sopra del 60% di ostruzione? Um, the question was that, uh, um, that uh, it wouldn't be logical to uh, think about treating, you know, these people uh, even much earlier, essentially, right, uh, with COPD. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the answer is, uh, is uh, yes, of course. You know, the, uh, you see, when we, when we, interestingly enough, when, and, uh, I, you know, we talked about this before, when you look at these huge trials in which they, you know, they kind of try to give treatment to COPD, um, Interestingly enough, uh, even though there are a lot of these people who do the trials are people from the gold, and then they wrote the gold, but they don't, they put all the gold together. So they, they say, COPD, one, two, three, and four, all together, and then they see what happens with the response to treatment, and then they find that the response. When you do a postdoc uh, in uh, analysis of these people, ti va bene così o ti parlo italiano? Ancora meglio, <laughs> Do, dopo lo dico in italiano ancora. No. In private. No in, private. Napol no in napoletano. <laughs> no in napoletano. Um, 
the, uh, the guys who responded are the twos, you know, the, the stage one and two. They are, those are the ones who respond. I mean, they improve the mortality, they improve the exacerbations, but not the fourth and not quasi the, tri the three. So, so you see, there is, but what's more is that in order to understand the disease, we have to go earlier when we start and say, why that guy only loses 20 and this guy loses 60 when they smoke? What is the difference? Now, we cannot do it that when we study these people at the end, because they are at the end, okay? But we can do it as a, in, if we really look into these people. That's why I'm saying, you know, the, how much money, how much time are we spending in these poor guys that we really, you know, we should do something in order to prevent them to arrive to that point. And that's our obligation. And this is what I'm saying that, you know, should be the, the, our societies that they say, okay, guys, I mean, they say in a little bit, that's what they are doing now with NIH. I mean, in a way, they are trying to find out about these people, you know, what, a little bit more about them. Uh, and this is, uh, and now the treatment maybe will help at that point, but then maybe we can find other treatments that will be much more directed once we understand what's going on. All right, okay, that's okay, see. Yeah, <laughs> good, good. Gracias. Thank you, thank you. Move, move.